calling all my friends. Like you just to talk to you. And you like you. Cause you know me fine by here. Like you. Maybe I promise I'm not a dumb fuck you. But I'm crossing my fingers. May okay, it's May okay. Or, hey, it's time for Pluto Tides from Twitter.com. <clears throat> okay, so I have to yet again rewrite this script, not because I keep messing up on one topic, but rather I cannot decide if I want to follow through with making said video. I had made a rather lengthy recording of my stance on deconstructive Christian theology, but I realized perhaps it wasn't my place to release such a topic yet and refrain from that. So, I'm scrapping that and going to make a more light-hearted video on one of my most recent hyperfixations, Hades. Uh, and if you're curious about the previous script I have it on my Patreon, it's nothing too controversial, I think, but I can understand if anyone is sensitive to said topic. Anyway, the game's been out since 2020, and initially I saw a pretty consistent craze of it on Twitter.com, but, uh, now it's kinda quiet, and I'm wondering if it's because Supergiant Games has a smaller audience. For those who don't know, Hades is a rogue light. Emphasis on the light, because apparently there's a difference between rogue-like and rogue-light. Dungeon crawling game, where you play as the son of Hades, Zagreus, who wants to escape the underworld. Problem is, your papa Hades doesn't want that, and has the constantly rearranging chambers and islands present you with hostile spirits to stall your progress. The nice thing, though, is that your surrogate mother, the embodiment of Night herself, has given you an epic mirror to grow stronger and reached out to your relatives on Olympus to lend their aid to you. So, you basically find little balls of blessings around in certain chambers, and they give you plenty of awesome powers from each god, where certain combinations can serve to give you a unique build each time. With that being said, I'd like to tell you why I personally adore this game. Okay, so first things first. What I find to be the most striking is the artistic direction. From the launch trailer, the fact that they got Spencer Wan, Wan, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that name, to help animate with the sequences, and gave me promise this was going to be a wonderful flip-flapping experience. Everything from the backgrounds, the props, the visual effects, the talk sprites, sound design, and voice acting is just impeccable. On the note of voice acting, I didn't have any crazy high expectations going into it, but was pleasantly surprised with how clean and personalized each voice was. Apparently, the voice actor for Zagreus is also the voice of the overall narrator. What's going on with Charon, by the way, if you can tell me, Than? <laughs> Cerberus is too busy living in the lap of luxury to pay much heed. And I'm sure that there are a few other voice actors slash actresses that cover a couple of other roles as well. I mention that because I think that the distinction is so clear that I would have never known had I not looked at the credits of the game. A good majority of the voices are edited and put through different pitches slash filters. I'm assuming for the distinction factor and also to give off the supernatural vibe that each character can hold. You'd think that overly editing something can make something feel a bit crude, but in this case, it worked to its advantage and easily made it something my brain used to remember each voice and character. So you've been trying to give to Symphony speech lessons between fights to the death? Do not fear your father's cruel legions, cousin. Their lives are long since forfeit. Battle with glory and all that, all right, stranger. Dancing on over to sound effects, it feels as if they've been handcrafted with love. I think so, anyway. Each time you come across a boon from a different god, or click on a keepsake, which I'll explain later, in the selection hub, there's this personalized noise that comes from it to say, Hey! This characteristic belongs to this character! It's this fella! The same goes for boon-empowered attacks slash power noises. For instance, if you use Poseidon's boons, you hear the splash of rough waves. With Ares, you hear the sound of slicing swords, and so on. Here's a nice little example for you. As for the talk sprites, they're absolutely gorgeous, each with line work that's simultaneously very clean and smooth, yet with a touch of human imperfection in them. The play with colors makes looking at each one sort of enigmatic, and I personally love discovering new details in each talk sprite upon multiple glances. 
since uh, most of them only have one or two to go around the entire game anyway. They also made coloring with black cool, like what the character artists for Sonic Riders did with their stuff. And the silhouettes. And you get the idea. Of course, I have to give credit to the 3D artist who modeled and textured the characters to resemble their 2D character art, because it's pretty spot on! Uh, obviously some things are exaggerated because you can't quite see all of the details on one character up close, hence why Orpheus looks a little terrifying to me. But the point is, they managed to communicate the artistic vision they had into all dimensions of the visual aspect of the game. There's no significant clash between the two styles that makes the presentation jarring, but it actually melds together to enhance a sense of believability and wonder in it. The inclusion of both 2D and 3D visual effects blends this all together and makes the final composition of the game all the more pleasant to look at. What you can tell apart from the individual styles actually allows certain details to pop, which helps in locating certain items and keeping an eye out for easter eggs. On to gameplay. The main advertising point of this game was its versatility in builds and scenarios. No single playthrough is the same, and it's rather different compared to role-playing games such as Skyrim. The greatest distinction point is that Skyrim slash other Elder Scrolls games is about an anonymous hero that can be any sex and race who can only make a couple of choices down similar routes with different outcomes. So the goals become more apparent in later playthroughs, and your facelessness kind of makes it easier to stick to a niche. <coughs> Stealth bowing! Hades has you assume the role of a more distinct character that you can't quite shape the character of, and the choices that he makes are more or less if he chooses to act on completing a certain task. The enjoyment of the experience comes out of not just the visual experience, but because even if your task is just busting out of hell multiple times and hitting bad guys, it's got ways of reinventing each run, both by the game's randomization factors and what you decide to invest in towards yourself. The kinds of Olympian gods you'll come across, the boons they offer, the rewards for each chamber, and the structure of those chambers change every run. Some specific powers come along later on in the game, some are only unlocked when you have other boons in your possession, and having that in effect for every god you come across brings a great level of variety to your playstyle, which comes in handy for your weapons. Yes, plural! Just because Zagreus has a sword in the animated trailer doesn't mean that there's only one thing he'll use. You get access to a signature Stygius Blade, the spear Varatha, the shield Aegis, the bow Konorak, the gauntlets Malfon, and a freaking gun! Exegriff. On top of there being different kinds of weapons with different playstyles regardless of what boon you have, you can also unlock up to four different aspects in each weapon. Aspects are different forms your weapons can take that have bonus properties, giving you a slight edge in your travels. I personally developed a preference for the Shield of Ages because I'm a reckless dumbass and like running into trouble, <coughs> lava and asphodel, and getting bombarded with attacks and projectiles. I usually favor certain Olympian gods and their boons to provide me with more of an offensive edge, like Dionysus or Zeus, or Ares, per se. Now that I've reached a point where I had to switch to another weapon, I realized I had to gravitate towards boons that gave me defense and allowed me a means to distance myself from my enemies, like Athena and Poseidon. This further becomes personalized when you get keepsakes involved. Yay, I get to explain this. There's a little system in the game where you can develop a special bond with everyone if you so choose, which usually comes in the form of gift giving. Specifically, you first give the character, if able, a bottle of nectar you come across in your travels to raise their affinity level. The first time they get it, they give you a little trinket of theirs that winds up giving you little buffs along the way, which you can level up the more you use it. Some help increase the rarity of certain boons you find, others can help you increase your dodge chance and so on. For certain characters, especially the ones that are supposed to be closest to you in the game, you can be given another special trinket if you get close enough to gift them with Ambrosia, basically nectar on steroids. They give you what's called a Chthonic Companion, which is an assortment of stuffed animals that give you support mechanisms if your back is against the wall. All of those variables to make crushing a bunch of hostile spirits to death that much more fun, even though they're already dead. But there's one more shtick to counter all those goodies you get from everyone around you, the Pact of Punishment. It usually appears after you've beaten Hades either the first or a few times, where it gives you conditions that make your escapes gradually more difficult. There's a list of added challenges and hazards that you can choose from that have assigned heat values. Basically, your difficulty gauge. The plus side is that you can get bounties from slaying each boss in the underworld under a certain heat with a certain weapon which maxes out at around 20 for some reason. 
Apparently, though, you can get above that, but I'm not sure how to get past it quite yet. With all that you have, you have the opportunity to fulfill certain prophecies, which is the game's quest log, essentially. It rewards you for completing certain challenges, using certain items, and fulfilling specific favors from people with gems, ambrosia, titan blood, darkness, and diamonds. When you're not fighting monsters, you can use what you've plundered from the underworld to renovate the House of Hades and specific quests much to the chagrin of your father, Hades. Also, you can fish in the game! What good is a game if it doesn't have a fishing mechanic in it? Story. It's rather simple, but the way that the characters react to each other and whatnot gives a whole slew of dialogue and interactions that you would have never expected in a game like this. There's small interactions and comments about certain weapons you may wield, your equipped keepsake, and recent story-related events that can include other people you've spoken to. This is why I've gotten addicted to the game, as the story and the interactions are so interesting, yet you need to allow time before you interact with the characters again after one conversation. Of course, the way you do that is by attempting another run, where the NPCs will be in other places and will usually have something else to say. I've uh, personally gotten past the end game, and I felt that perhaps I was reaching the end of the line when I felt like I was running out of dialogue options, but I was wrong! Some characters always have something new to say about something, and even if it may not pertain to a certain quest, it always engages me with how personalized and organic each conversation feels. I'm even more surprised with how that organicness leads toward great LGBTQ plus representation. Orpheus, in my opinion, is a rather effeminate gender non-conforming kind of guy. Achilles, your beloved mentor, is torn over the lost love of his partner and fellow warrior. Pat Patroclus? 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 Patro... St Patrick? Patrick. I'll call him Patrick. Master Chaos, the primordial being from which all things sprang from, is enigmatically non-binary. Artemis, in certain articles, has a nymph named Callisto, whom she speaks of fondly and is described as her partner. And, most importantly, you, the main character, have the capacity to romance one of the Furies, Megara, and the god of death, Thanatos, and uh, kind of sort of Dusa, a disembodied gorgon head who does a lot of the cleaning around certain parts. Heck, it's even mentioned that you can romance all without consequence, which can lead into a polyamorous relationship. Or you can reject their advances and the characters will respect your choice, not negatively impacting your pre-established relationships between the characters in question. And of course, there's the option to romance one or the other, in case you swing one way. Although we in real life might have more complicated stories leading up to certain conclusions like this, it's honestly a great way to point out that the possibility for amicable arrangements and romance to come about. It's not even that direct about it in terms of dialogue. Zagreus is very awkward, but tries to be candid and heartfelt, and the recipient of his affections responds in their own way. The way each character speaks about others they know about also shows a great range of realism. Even if they are supernatural mythological deities and entities. One character might have an opinion on another character that reveals a darker aspect of themselves, yet it doesn't discredit them as a person. Everyone is kind of nuanced in a way where you can still respect them. Even Theseus, despite his braggart behavior, is respectable on a non-verbal level, due to his friendship with the Minotaur that he had slain in life. Of course, some are still more likable than others, and others are more readable than others, but that's just life, isn't it? Apart from navigating your own personal family drama, you have the opportunity to get rewards and bring those in the underworld some comfort and happiness by resolving their own, too. Figuring out how your choices impact others in the next couple of runs is another factor as to why I stay up until 4am playing this game sometimes. Aha! Another important factor that can be overlooked sometimes, even if it is the main focus of the game, is Zagreus' relationship with his father, Hades. Hades is established to be a cold and strict figure, leaving more of the emotional nurturing to the surrogate mother Nyx. Some of your escapes can be preceded with Zagreus' childhood memories of the harsh things that his father has said to him, which is uh, pretty much the god version of emotional neglect. That's just a given. You're going to have to deal with some chiding remarks from everyone save for a few exceptional individuals. Now, uh, this is where I go into spoiler territory, even though the game's been out for a couple of years. Have fun! Zagreus, when he's successful with his first few escape attempts, meets his mother, Persephone, who had left the underworld under the impression that Zagreus was stillborn. 
kind of ironic, in the sense that Zag is the son of the god of the dead, and still being a god, was stillborn. But I digress. Nyx, Night Incarnate, asked her daughters, the three fates, to resurrect Zagreus. Which was, uh, done after Persephone had left. This is of course a shock, and over the course of the next few successful escapes, both Zagreus and Persephone learn that Hades, despite his cold exterior, still thinks of Persephone, and yet he is resolute in not upsetting a delicate familial balance that was shifted from his wife's disappearance. Long story short, Zeus in this iteration secretly took Persephone to Hades, because he felt bad that he was stuck with all the dead people. This disappearance greatly upset Persephone's mother, Demeter, who has, and still does, keep the surface world a lifeless and frigid place. Yay. Hades was also kind of pissed off, given that he wasn't really asking for a wife, and wanted to do his job. He didn't do anything to Persephone, and gave her ample space. The two eventually fell in love and got married, and then the whole stillborn incident happened. So, what the heck does this have to do with Hades as a person? Right. Hades is a very by-the-rule sort of person, and yet he is surprised when Persephone has made up her mind and decides to return to the underworld. With Persephone back, she encourages Hades to be kinder to their son, and it's established that he does not expect forgiveness from Zagreus, and recognizes the harshness of his actions. After this, your escape attempts are deemed to be of great importance, and it becomes your job to test the security of the underworld. Hades even stops referring to Zagreus as boy, and recalls him by his name, encouraging him to get rest in between his escapes while still laughing at his demise. So even if Hades' demeanor hasn't changed all that much, and Zagreus still has a strained opinion of his father, their relationship improves into one of begrudging respect, and I think it's important to stress the nuance and all that. You don't obviously have to forgive someone who has hurt you, but if both parties try, they can still coexist. Obviously, this is, um, all very circumstantial and doesn't apply to every case, but it's still an important perspective to consider. And there you go, that's why I like the game Hades. Pretty fun and endearing. Can't wait to get to the part where I get to have a threesome with Megan Fan. Have a good day!